recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff. This is Triviality. Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Neil, and I'm going to start right away by saying Matt isn't here, no. unfortunately, uh, but Ken and Jeff are. He's on the road again, right? He's on the road again. But not, not for his move. No. It's it's because he's he wanted to go see the largest ball of twine, right? He wanted to see the largest ball of twine while listening to On the Road Again by <laughs> Willie Nelson. Just on repeat. That's on the repeat. only song he's got in his car. It's like uh, How I Met Your Mother when they have to listen to 500... Uh, was it 500 miles, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, I think so. In the Fiero? I, See, I, and I, I was going to go the turn the page method. Ah, you know, the Bob Seger? Classic Bob Seger. Or the Seger, Metallica version. Yeah. The return of Metallica from last week. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's true. Yeah, Nice call back there. Um, and who's Bob Seger's saxophonist? Do you know? I can't remember. I don't know. Curtis? Offhand. I think Curtis is wrong, but that's just a name I threw out. My mom used to like him. He, she loves Bob Seger, so she always said, oh, he has the best saxophonist along with the E Street Band, but I can never remember their names. Clarence. That's the E Street guy. Doesn't okay. matter. Anyway, <laughs> um, so enough of the saxophone talk. Uh, sexy talk is for our After Dark ep- ep- episodes. So. That's right. Uh, well, yeah, we have some very special guests with us today. Uh, we'll start with our host. Um, he is an Oakland Five supporter on Patreon. He's come to us from Duluth, Minnesota. I don't even think he's fully moved in yet. Uh, behind him is just a bunch of boxes and one guitar, so he's ready to shred at any moment's notice. Uh, but that is Wade Hoskin. How are you, Wade? uh doing really well uh happy to be on um yeah no i'm coming up from the uh twin cities of minnesota and i figured they just weren't quite cold enough for me so i need to get a, a little chillier that's all right we understand that over here in chicago why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh and uh, what we have in store for today uh sure yeah no i uh i am a uh, chemist turned park ranger who decided that he didn't like to be a park ranger so uh, i'm up in duluth uh making another shift in careers, trying to go back to school for uh, engineering. Um, no, I uh, wrote, a, I think, a particularly uh, hard set of questions for you guys uh, tonight. Um, uh, you guys know a whole lot more about um, pop culture than I do, so I had to lean on some different subjects, but uh, hopefully uh, not everyone will hate me by the end of the night. <laughs> well, I'm glad I've got Jeff on my side. Yeah, Ken, you're actually going to partner with Jeff. I yeah. decided I it's was going to be a cage out. match. It is going to be a cage match. Jeff actually came in here. He brought a 35 pound weight and was just pumping his bicep up because he heard geography and the call. Mm-hmm. So just like a good park ranger, he heard a call and and now the excitement's coming. Like okay. if you see a hawk and a hawk comes, you know what I mean. So we said this was a cage match. Who are we in the cage with today? You are in the cage with uh, two people who have a wonderful podcast. I'll let them describe it. Um, had the pleasure of getting to know them. Thank you to our listener Sean Bernstein for putting us in touch. Uh, and they're actually coming to us from Toronto, uh, and that is Bryn Bernie and Aaron Yeager. How are you both? Great. Hi, we're great. Hi. Thanks, thanks so much for having us, guys. And well, impressive we're... that you uh, didn't say the second T in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, you pronounced it like like Thumbs a real up. Torontonian. Oh, it was, we, it was... we were informed early on in our podcasting career that you don't pronounce the second T. <laughs> no, it's in, just in Toronto. any case, Toronto. It reminds us of uh, there's a Chicago bread company here called Toronto. I knew you were going to say that. Uh, which is basically in any place you want to get food, it's like we have Toronto bread. It's like of course you because it's down the block. Yeah. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and also about your podcast, because I think anyone who is a fan of pop culture uh, and great personalities is going to love it. Oh, well, yeah. thank you. Um, so we do a podcast called That Was a Show with a question mark, and we review failed or forgotten sitcoms from the 80s and 90s. So these are short-lived shows that many of which no one's really heard of, at least not in recent years. And uh, we co-host this show along with our friend Barry. His actual name's Andrew, but we call him Barry, which is an ongoing joke as well. And uh, you can you can explain how the format of our show works. Yeah, I mean, we just kind of have fun with it. We watch these old shows and uh, we sort of look at them through a 2021 20, lens, uh, but not really. We kind of just, uh, you know, we, we do a couple fun segments. We have one called uh, Six Degrees of Friends where we'll like connect this like very obscure show to friends uh, in Six Degrees or Less. Um, and we talk about what people went on to do after this kind of uh, failure of a show. So yeah, okay. I don't know. We have a really fun time with it. Sounds fun. Well, we do encourage all of our listeners to check out that show. 
Uh, and we look forward to diving into this game, but first, got to get the rules. We have to get the rules. Wade, any preference on the rules read? Uh, I would love to have a, a Dutch rules read. Oh, all right. All right, let's hear the Dutch rules read. Uh, also, uh, simultaneously reading the periodic table of elements for Wade. De regels van het spel zijn simpel. 20 vragen verdeeld over twee rondes, waarbij elke vraag 10 punten waard is. Halverwege is er een speciale swingronde, ontworpen door de host van deze week. Na deze rondes beginnen de spelers aan de finale, met de punten die ze hebben verdiend. En hebben ze de mogelijkheid om 0 tot 30 punten in te zetten op 5 gecategoriseerde vragen. Aan het eind van het spel wordt iemand benoemd tot the cream of the crop. I am the cream! All right, well, reading the periodic table of elements in Dutch uh, certainly um, inspired me. And he also said uh, Jeff was pumping up to get this academic contest in order, right? That's correct. So we're going to be pumping FE. Pumping FE, okay. All right. And uh, Brendan Aaron, uh, do you have a certain team name you'd like to use or would you like to be just that was a show or that was a show? Yeah, we could be that was a show or you can use our acronym TWAS. Yeah. Ooh, I like TWAS. Yeah. All right. How about what if we combine it? We'll be TWAS a show. How's that? Yeah. That, that's pretty good. I like it. All right. That that's was a good. show, a show. Okay. Yeah. So we have pumping FE versus TWAS a show. Wade, uh, feel free to take it away. And I'm just going to be sitting back here and thankfully not answering any geography questions. All right, we're going to start off in the realm of human biology. Uh, kind of a big question for you. Uh, every organism known to humankind can be classified as belonging to, in descending order, a kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. For three points each, name as many of the correct taxonomic classifications as you can for modern humans. That is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. All right, we're going to go ahead and lock in here after some discussion. So from the top, uh, animal, although I put animalia, uh, mammal, great apes, homo sapiens, and sapiens. Um, yeah, we put um, animalia for kingdom, chordata for phylum, mammalia for class, Order we didn't know. We just put primates. Same thing with family. We put apes and then Homo sapien. Awesome. Uh, pumping FE. I think you guys just about nailed it. Um, yeah. Uh, from top down, it's uh, Animalia, Chordata, Mammalia, Primates, uh, the Great Apes or the Hominids, Homo, then Sapiens. So uh, looks like you guys got uh, all seven by my Ken. And uh, Twas, you guys got a. Uh, Got five of the seven with Animalia, Mammalia, Great Apes, Homo, and Sapiens. So it looks like a 15 for Twas and a 21 for a Pump and FE. And I helped. I would like to <laughs> uh, thank Community Season 2, Episode 1 for the um, Kingdom Anthropology <laughs> rap at the end. Because uh, that's how I remembered most of it. Of course, it just eventually devolves into singing Africa by Toto, um, <laughs> which I think is the right call. But shout out there to one of my favorite shows. Wow, I think that was the first time we had uh, a first question point total of 21 or 15. So uh, great job, everyone. Great. And yeah, let's uh, hear question two, Wade. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm counting those first as uh, two questions. We'll call this one question three. Uh, we're going to dip our toe into some sports. Uh, in the history of the NBA, three players have won both the league's MVP award and Defensive Player of the Year award in the same season. The first of these players achieved this in 1989 the second in 1994, and the third in 2020. Name two of them, or name all three for five bonus points. And uh, Ken, if you want to trust me on this, I think we got him. All right, sounds good. I mean, we don't, but I've got answers. Yeah, that's good enough. For me. <laughs> and you guys? We do not have answers for this question. <laughs> we, our knowledge base for sports is not good. <laughs> Listen, take it from me, there's no shame in just naming three Space Jam characters. Well, I mean... Oh, man. Might as well throw in a Michael Jordan, because <laughs> I assume he won lots of awards. Lots of stuff. Maybe for the 1994. Yeah. And then, oh my God, who was the basketball player that was in that hilarious sketch on Kroll Show? 
Oh, it's Larry Bird. Larry Bird. Yeah. I'm going to go with Larry Bird for 89 just because. We're just naming random. Because it's a really That's funny sketch. Yeah. I'm not even going to try with this <gasps> Is one. Is it cause... a Raptors player? That'd be really bad if we didn't know that. Ooh, that'd be so embarrassing. <laughs> Is it Drake? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say Drake. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get creamed on this. Well, yeah. Not necessarily. I think MJ might be right. We put uh, Isaiah Thomas for 89, Charles Barkley for 94, and Giannis Atakempo for 2020. Uh, sure. Looks like uh, both teams got at least a one right name there. Um, 89 was uh, Michael Jordan. Uh, 94 was Hakeem Olajuwon. And 2020 oh, yeah. was uh, Giannis uh, Antetokounmpo. But no, I think uh, I'm feeling generous. I think uh, five points to each team for uh, getting half the answer right. Wow. That was basically the equivalent of circling C on the multiple choice it, test. It really was. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, cool. Uh, if we're ready to move on, I got uh, what I have listed as question number four for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about naval tradition. Uh, if neither Captain Kirk nor Commander Spock are capable of assuming command of the Enterprise... The captain's chair would likely fall to the third highest ranked officer. Who is it? All right. Um, I think we actually have this maybe from one of the movies. So we're going to go ahead and lock in. What are you guys thinking, Twas? Okay, well, here's what we're thinking. It's one of the bridge crew, someone highly ranked, someone memorable. We're going to go Sulu, Lieutenant Commander, I believe. Yeah, we also said Sulu. Uh, so there is a... A lot of debate around this question, but uh, Sulu <laughs> was not promoted to a lieutenant commander until the Wrath of Khan. Uh, <laughs> ranking him is Lieutenant Commander Montgomery Scott. Okay. <gasps> I was. Oh my gosh! I told him that from the beginning, and he, Aaron, was like, "No." I, I was just right. remember from. Uh, I just remember from. Right. Uh, I think Into Darkness, Sulu takes the the captain's chair at mm. one point, but okay. oh, does he? Yeah, that's as far as I could get. Uh, coming up, uh, question five, uh, we're going to be diving way back to some Roman history. Uh, the first and second Roman triumvirates were a trio of Roman leaders instrumental in the transition of the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. Julius Caesar led the first and his successor Augustus led the second. For five points each, name another member of the first triumvirate and another member of the second. Okay, uh, Jeff thinks he has a fairly decent guess on this, so we're going to lock in. Okay, I think I've got a couple of names here. <laughs> so these are really just two other potential Roman emperors that have names that we could remember. So there's uh, coming in from uh, Bryn is Brutus, and coming in from Aaron is Marcus Aurelius. Okay. We, we're not going with Caligula, Jeff. Caligula was later, <laughs> pretty sure. Um, no, we uh, we locked in uh, Mark Antony and uh, the singer, of course. I need uh, to know. <laughs> uh, and Pompey, who I, I the, the name sticks out. I, I don't know if he was a general or part of the triumvirate. No, uh, great job. Yeah, it looks like uh, Pumping F.E. got a full points there, although uh, Twas, you guys got some... Very good, irrelevant Roman names. Uh, no, the first triumvirate, uh, in addition to Caesar, had uh, Crassus and uh, Pompey the Great. And the second triumvirate was uh, Mark Antony and Marcus Lepidus. Crassus, of course, uh, most okay. known for mooning people. <laughs> I, I want to say Crassus was part of the triumvirate just because he was, like, filthy rich. That's a good way to yeah. get part of the triumvirate. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, it looks like after five questions, uh, Twas a Show is at 20 points, and Narrowly Ahead is pumping FE with 36. So anyone's game. Well, uh, we'll see if we can uh, balance it out with question six. Uh, a quote from the Organic Act of 1872 is inscribed on a stone arch in Montana. While the act was signed into law by President Grant, the arch is named for a different president who served a few decades later. What did the Organic Act of 1872 establish? Uh, would you guys like a, a hint that's the quote on the arch, or would you like uh, the name of the president uh, the arch is named after? Let's take the quote. Cool. The uh, quote on the arch is, uh, for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. All right, with that quote in mind, I think we know the president and the act, so we're locked in. You know what? 
I'm just going to go with that first instinct. Yeah, go Because why it. not? Um, we're going to say that this has something to do with establishing the national parks system. And I don't think we had to say the name of the president, but... Did we? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> Because I'd uh, probably get that. We're wrong. Canucks. We don't have to know this. <laughs> well, if 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 this that's wrong, we're going down with you because we think it's Roosevelt and uh, national parks. Uh, sure. No. Yeah. I'll uh, I will give uh, I'll give you guys both points. Uh, so it's specifically it established Yellowstone National Park, which was the first oh. national park. So I'd say yeah, it established the national parks. I think so. Good job. Oh, well, well done for a couple of Canucks. I'm I'm proud yeah. of you guys. Yeah, no, uh, so luckily for you guys, the category for question seven is uh, Tim Horton's Donut Flavors. Oh! <laughs> hey, it's not, I'm sorry. That was, was my first job as a high schooler with Tim Horton's. Is that Jeff like the, equally disappointed. Is that like the <laughs> mandatory uh, mandatory service is all Canadians have to work at Tim Horton's for two yeah, years at a high school? I, I think so. It's like the Israeli so. is military. <laughs> <laughs> but actually... Uh, Question, question seven is going to be uh, coming from my dad's record collection. Uh, number okay. seven. Uh, in college, uh, Chevy Chase was the drummer for a band with two of his more musically inclined classmates. While Chevy Chase went on to be a movie and television star, his classmates reeled in their own success by going on to form what band to the joy of yacht dads and beatnik audiophiles everywhere. All right. It sounds like Jeff knows what he's talking about, and this is news to me. He so. does. He does not know what he's talking about. Jeff is a <laughs> yacht rock stan. Well, the audiophile beatnik thing is kind of my my jam. So go for it. This is kind of a wild guess, but I said a Steely Dan. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, audiophiles everywhere, and uh, maybe if you're reeling in the years, it's got to be Steely Dan. So uh, it is Steely Dan. Oh uh, yeah. How was Chevy Chase and basically Steely Dan? How was how was Donald Fagan in a room with Chevy Chase? That's what I need to know. Yeah, there's a, there's a reason that they didn't uh, move forward as a band, probably. <laughs> so. Chevy Chase, notorious douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know if there's any like photos or video of him <laughs> with them. Uh, I've tried. It sounds like it was like a thing they did for a couple weeks in college, but uh, okay. I don't know. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be in a All band right, with Chevy Chase. A Let's get rid of him. <laughs> Uh, no, great job. Great job to both teams. Uh, great pull on the uh, reeling in the years hint there, too, though. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to keep talking about popular music with question eight. Uh, of the top ten best-selling albums of all time, seven are studio albums, one is a compilation, and two are movie soundtracks for movies that came out 15 years apart. What are those movies? Okay, we are locked in with two answers here. We debated each other on yeah, one of the this years. This is a very. This might be like a contentious like issue in our relationship now because. <laughs> but she was right about Scotty, so I'm giving it. Yeah, to her. he's not trusting me with my. Okay. No, I'm trusting you. I'm giving it to you now. What do you got? Okay, so I'm gonna say, um, so the, like, the the older of the two is Jesus Christ Superstar, and The Bodyguard. Okay. Yeah, we too had the bodyguard, and initially we were thinking Frozen, but the timeline wasn't quite right. So we figure Frozen probably just didn't sell enough albums because it's more modern. So we went back in time and didn't say Back to the Future. We said Grease. Very close. Ooh, yeah. Sounds like uh, Neil knows what he's talking about. Um, close. I think uh, Grease too. Both both teams got at least uh, one right. <laughs> The much better known Grease, too. Uh, both teams got at least one answer, right? Uh, the Bodyguard from 1992 was yeah. one, but uh, released in 1977, A Fever Saturday Night, Fever, Fever Night, <gasps> Saturday Night Fever. Oh, Damn it. Sorry, of can course. I just, of course. About that. Man, was... we all should have known that. Thank God I deferred to you on uh, The Bodyguard, Kay. though. Okay, Aaron wanted to say Forrest Gump, and I was like, no, it's not Forrest Gump. <laughs> Okay. It's the bodyguard. The bodyguard is like the highest selling of all time. Well, good good that thing I deferred to you on that. Yeah. But I was very convinced. So yeah. we doing half points there or no uh, points? Sure. Why not? I like points. Let's uh, let's give right, five, five points, points to both team. And I mentioned number three because number three stars the man above my shoulder right now. It's Dirty Dancing. Mm. We'll keep blasting on to number nine. In 1953... 
two Californians opened a restaurant called Danny's Donuts. A few years later, the restaurant was reconceptualized as Danny's Coffee. To avoid confusion with another local chain called Coffee Dan's, they made a small change to the name, and the restaurant is now better known as what? All right, so we're uh, gyrating back and forth between uh, <laughs> Krispy Kreme and Denny's. Right. Denny's doesn't serve donuts. No, but Randy's but maybe they did serves before. donuts. So maybe it's Randy's Donuts. And he said kidding. slight change of name, right? Yeah. So Krispy Kreme is out. Maybe a Georgia so. company. So let's go Denny's. Let's go for that Grand Slam. We had also landed on Denny's. <laughs> um, I was concerned about the lack of donuts on their menu, but the name thing just makes a lot of sense. Uh, no, great job. Points to both teams. Uh, they Woo-hoo! became Denny's. Uh, yeah, it was originally called Danny's Donuts, and then they were reconceptualized as a, a breakfast joint called Danny's Coffee. So, uh, no, great job. Cool. I want to imagine that there was like a marketing guru who came in. He's like, we need to reconceptualize your brand. What if you change the A to an <laughs> E? It's the, the worst episode of Mad Men ever. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to go cheat on my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, uh, well, we're going to round out uh, the first half by moving into some leisure. Uh, question number 10. Originally made from hard, non-buoyant rubber and intended as a chew toy, what toy later rose to popularity when a softer vinyl version was patented in 1947? This popularity further skyrocketed thanks to a song that hit number 11 on the Billboard charts in 1971. Good thinking, Jeff. It's all coming together, and we're locked in. Well, I guess we're going to go with some sort of beach ball that would have related to, what did you call it, surf music? I don't know. Surf I was rock? thinking surf rock from the, like... Like 50s. Well, they said the 70s, so... 70s? Yeah, early 70s. Okay, so it's a Beach Boys thing. Well, then it's a freaking beach ball. Then. Beach ball, <laughs> Beach Boys... Beach related beach, beach vinyl thing. vinyl toy. Yeah. Boom. Beach ball. Rubber ducky, you're the one. <gasps> you <gasps> make bad time lots of fun. Uh, sounds to me like uh pumping FE is getting getting the points oh, there. Man. Yeah, it is the uh, rubber duck. Yeah, Jeff came up with the answer, but it was my uh, my option to sing. Oh my god! Well, this is embarrassing. This is really embarrassing. We're getting creamed here. Twas a show, still in it. Fifty-five points, a uh, very commendable <laughs> number. And pumping fe. I keep wanting to say pumping iron. The art, the great Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary. Well, but that's that's what that's the idea. Is that what the idea is? I just it that's went a, right over my F-E. head. It went right over my head. Um, iron, iron is fe. Oh, is that today, what it is? Today's uh, chemistry lesson for Neil. Oh yeah, it is a chemistry lesson, You're right? Um, all right. Well, you guys have eighty-one, so it's eighty-one to fifty-five. No, great job. Was, uh, I, I'm sorry for making you uh, adding up uh, odd numbers uh, all the way through, Neil. But uh, cool. So I think uh, up next we have the swing round, right? Uh, I just got uh, 10 questions that I'm all very proud of. So uh, every question will give you a word or short phrase that is an anagram of a Bond film. Uh, you're going to have to give me the name of the Bond film. <laughs> <laughs> It, uh, so this round, it starts off uh, pretty grounded, and it goes off the rails really quickly, so good luck. Uh, number one, uh, although more famously insisted upon by a different singer in 1967, this was first demanded by Otis Redding in 1965. Number two, the patriarch of the Foreman family of Point Place, Wisconsin, is swinging a club on the back nine. Number three, we are little teapots, short and stout. You can see our brazen and immodest handles, but we are a little more shy about our blank blank. Number four. This is a member of the hardy mountain-faring people indigenous to Skyrim. Number five. A woman was very hungry, so she baked a distinctively shaped donut-like cake. There were no leftovers, however, as she ate blank 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 number six one of the carpenters the erstwhile co-star of doctor who and the most recent second lady of the united states are all hanging out on a wet highland hill characteristic of great britain number seven an insect member of the order diptera is named after a groundbreaking american virologist eight 
an NBC news program in which Mephistopheles has replaced Lester Holt. Nine, a traditional form of Alpine song sung by the former partner of Roger Ebert. And ten, the hit single off of Toys in the Attic, but the sugar is replaced with aspartame. So every question there will give you a word or short phrase, and that word or short phrase is an anagram of a Bond film. <laughs> you are a mad scientist, Wade. Um, everyone here is going to go over these, and you know what? I think we'll throw the clues in the show notes, uh, possibly as well. We'll see. But we're going to be right back with some answers. And we're back from a break uh, where we tried our best to figure these out. It was tough. It took us a long time, guys. So if you wanted to pause the podcast, I don't blame you. So let's get the answers. Uh, sure. Uh, number one, although more famously insisted upon by a different singer in 1967, this was first demanded by Otis Redding in 1965. Uh, we think it's S-P-E-C-T-R-E. Um, so we said Spectre from the... Uh, Song Respect. We uh, did not have such an astute guess. We didn't get, yeah, we didn't get in it. We thought the song was Try a Little Tenderness. Yeah. And we could not pull a movie title out of that. <laughs> We're like, what? No, yeah, it, it helps to spell it out. Uh, yeah, it was Respect uh, into okay. Spectre. That's very clever. Uh, number two, uh, the patriarch of the Foreman family of Point Place, Wisconsin is swinging a club on the back nine. All right, we know it's red, and if he's swinging a club, he's probably golfing, so we went with Goldfinger. We also went with uh, red golfing into Goldfinger, and that's probably the only one that we're, we're very confident, confident in. <laughs> well, you should be confident. Uh, points all around. Both teams got it right. Nice. Nice. Uh, third one was, <laughs> we are little teapots, short and stout. You can see our brazen and immodest handles, but we are a little more shy about our blank blank. I think they're shy about their coy spouts, which I believe anagrams to octopussy. <laughs> <laughs> we reverse engineered that one, though, just to be fair. Yeah. Wow. Well, we had the word spout. Didn't <laughs> quite make it uh, as far as as that. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, well, well done to a uh, pumping F-E or pumping F-E if you prefer. Uh, yeah, it was Koi Spouts or Octopussy. Uh, yeah, I was kind of, I was kind of expecting people to reverse engineer that one. Next one, uh, this is a member of the hardy mountain faring people indigenous to Skyrim. Another reverse engineer here. I said, uh, Dr. No, and he said that fits because of the Nords. Uh, we didn't really have anything for that one. Okay, so nothing there. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, yeah, nope. It was a uh, Nord into Doctor No. Although, yeah, it sounds like you were uh, thinking about Doctor No's brother, uh, Turb No. Uh, next one was a woman was very hungry, so she baked a distinctively shaped donut-like cake. There were no leftovers, however, as she ate blank, blank, blank. I think it's something like all the bunt, um, but we got bunt into Thunderball, so we said Thunderball. Um, well, we were playing with Bunt, then uh, we also had a, a funny take on the clue that uh, she ate the whole thing, whole as H-O-L-E. Instead of whole. Like, but, mm -hmm. uh, but then that didn't give us anything. Didn't give us anything. So... Any so. <laughs> Moving on. Oh, yeah, it was, uh, it closed with all the Bunt. It was all her Bunt, which is an all anagram of Thunderball. So uh, really okay. well done there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next one we had was one of the Carpenters, the erstwhile co-star of Doctor Who, and the most recent Second Lady of the United States are all hanging out on a wet Highland Hill characteristic of Great Britain. So we got Karen, and then uh, Jeff unscrambled that in two. Uh, well, I figured out that that would fit if you add more to Moonraker. So you might have been right about the moor. Yeah, he second-guessed me again because I had said more in our um, initial <laughs> conversations, but Aaron oh, second-guessed me again. Oh, because you would have gotten Moonraker from that? <laughs> no, I would not have. <laughs> Aaron said it was the moops. Yeah, the moops. <laughs> yeah. So nothing there? Just, it no, was the nothing, moops. Nothing. It's a misprint. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, a uh, great job there. Uh Seven was an insect member of the order Diptera 
is named after a groundbreaking American virologist. All right, this is where it gets tricky, um, but we you said butterflies were what? Lepidoptera. So I said Terra probably means something that flies. We got went to Mosquito, and I was able to fit that into Quantum of Solace. So we said Quantum of Solace, but we didn't figure out the whole clue. We got, <laughs> we, we, we got nothing. Crickets over here. <laughs> sure. Um. <laughs> Uh, very close and, uh, you know, great job on fitting into quantum solace, but, uh, Diptera refers to the common house fly Where and the virologist in mind was Jonas Salk. It was the Salk fly or Skyfall. Ooh. Uh, number eight, uh, an NBC news program in which Mephistopheles has replaced Lester Holt. Yep. Saw a lot of, uh, combinations of letters between, uh, nightly and daylights. So we guessed living daylights. This is deeply embarrassing. <laughs> just, 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 just keep going. Just keep going. What do we got? Keep going. Uh, yeah. Do you want to? Do you want to um, toss one in as your answer? We had jotted down "live and let die." All right. Well, in that case, uh, an NBC news program which Mephistopheles is replaced Mr. Holt is "Devil Dateline" or "Live and Let Die." There you go. <laughs> Never hurts to guess. <laughs> Yeah, always throw a guess out. (laughs) (laughs) Well done. Um, Number nine. (laughs) Yes. That's my favorite correct answer of the entire episode. (laughs) We got it wrong. Really good job. You guys figured it out, I'm sure. I swear that's written here. Um, number nine, a traditional form of Alpine song sung by the former partner of Roger Ebert. We went to Yodel Jean and said Goldeneye. Well, we knew it was Yodel, but... We knew Yodel and we knew it was either Ropert or Siskel, but we didn't think to go first names. We didn't go first names, so we really... uh, Yeah, I don't play by Jeopardy rules. Uh, No, well done, uh, Pumpin' F.E. It was a a Gene Yodel or Yodel Jean into Goldeneye. And the last one, the hit single off of Toys in the Attic, but the sugar is replaced with aspartame. Died emotion. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, Dude, it's a good do, acoustic do, 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 cover. Do, do, do. We had, uh, we had died emotion like right away. And it took us forever to figure out that you're probably alluding to the new film that's not yet released. No time to die. Any thoughts, uh, twas? No. No. Well, I mean, I think we overthought this one. Um, we went with the song "Pour Some Sugar." Yeah, we got on the, the album wrong. Like we, yeah. like really chunked that. We like. So we ended yeah. up playing don't, around don't with sweetener and artificial. Yeah, and... we really went on a weird journey. Like, didn't work well, out. Didn't work well, out. We didn't great get job to a uh, pump and a fee. It was a uh, diet emotion <laughs> into no time to die. Got a little sneaky with you guys on that one, but uh, no, that oh, is a uh, that is a uh, maybe a. Uh, my, my favorite set of uh, 10 questions I've uh, ever looked at for trivia. Very thera- well done. My therapist says I have diet emotion. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, after the swing round, um, no shame in uh, two questions correct there for Twas. They picked up 10 wow. points, bringing yeah. their total to 65. And uh, Pumping <laughs> Iron uh, is up to 121. So 121 to 65. So I don't believe the next set of questions are anagrams. Is that uh, correct, Wade? Uh... I might have to do some quick modification here. Nope, we have uh, no anagrams for the remainder of the night. Uh, Bouncing into the first question of the second half. Uh, The English name Jesus is derived from a Greek transliteration of a Hebrew and Aramaic name that is still in use today. What is this name, which is shared by one of the lead actors in the Broadway cast of Book of Mormon? A little hint for you. This name was one of the top five male baby names in the U.S. every year from 1983 to 2008. All right. These guys are locked in. So um, we're just going to tap right out on this one. Sadly, we have no idea. Yeah, we went with Joshua. Uh, Great job. It is a translation of Joshua, of course, referencing Josh Gad, who played uh, Elder Cunningham in Book of Mormon. Uh, no, nice. great job, guys. Uh, I, I, I see the uh, beginnings of a comeback starting to mount here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is her brother's name. <laughs> Don't call oh, it a sure. comeback. There you go. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on to the second question of the second half. Uh, 
Andrzej Tchaikovsky was a Polish musician who died from colon cancer in 1982 without ever performing in a play. Despite this obstacle, he still got to appear on stage in 2008 alongside David Tennant. What character did he portray? Uh, we don't know, so we're going to lock in. Yeah, we are <laughs> definitely not going to have a right answer. You know, I'm just going to put something out there. I'm going to say uh, he plays his cat. Okay. All right. Uh, cool, and what do we have from uh, Pumpin' Fe? We believe that he appears in the play Equus as uh, Daniel Radcliffe's penis. <laughs> you're, re- <laughs> you're, you're, you're closer than you know. Uh, no, um, Andrzej Tchaikovsky ended up uh, portraying Yorick, better known as the skull in Hamlet. Mm. To be or not to be. Wow. That is They use the dark. human skull? In Shakespeare's scripts notes, make sure you use a human skull. It, it was uh, not encouraged to drink out of it after the play, as he often did. But... <laughs> At the cast party, yeah. yeah. Number three of the second half, uh, Emil Jannings was the first actor to win the Academy Award for Best Actor, though he proceeded to star in a number of regrettable German films in the following decades. Because of this connection, he was portrayed in a cameo appearance during the climax of what 2009 war film? We're locked in. Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're going to go with uh, Inglorious Bastards. Yeah, we said that too. Uh, yeah, points all around. It was uh, Inglorious Bastards. The year 2009 really rings a bell to me. <laughs> when I hear 2009 film, I think Inglorious Bastards. It's the year you became a man. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and in uh, honor of Ken becoming a man in 2009 uh i'm gonna make myself available as a tag team it's not partner the case it's for not the uh case. for brendan aaron just because okay these questions are now in, in my wheelhouse which okay. they weren't before so you're feeling you're feeling like you want to suddenly answer some questions i am so if you guys so you're need joining my, the enemy yes okay. i'll join the enemy so if you need my help just say tag and i'll okay. give, try to give you a good answer okay. well okay, uh great timing neil because uh question four is about math oh, <laughs> I, I i rescind my comments <laughs> Uh, number four of the second half, one of the most important constants in mathematics, E, is named for what Swiss mathematician, not to be mistaken with Warren Moon or Earl Campbell? Don't worry about the just, we're you, locked you, in. You, you were writing it down and then you started thinking about it <laughs> with the clues. All right, we're locked in. Oh, I get it. My brain worked. <laughs> Don't let yourself be fooled by extra clues. <laughs> no, I figured it out. I definitely... You're it con- extremely confident, and then you just stopped. <laughs> it confirmed what I already knew. Look the big brain on Jeff. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping that this would be like a, an algebra question that I could just like work out the... Y the equals and... 4x squared. <laughs> yeah. Um... I know and the, the 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 frustrating thing is that I know that I've heard the answer to this in the not so distant past and I cannot remember it. Mm-hmm. Is Escher someone? Someone. I was going <laughs> to say that it was a uh, eunuch but then they cut off all the other letters and it just became e. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I believe this is uh Euler, which uh would be the team that uh, those other two guys played on at one point. Yeah. Uh, no, well done. This is a uh, Leonard Euler. Uh, yeah, and uh, Warren Moon and Earl Campbell both uh, famously played for the Houston Oilers. Uh, but no, great guess with Escher. Uh, Escher was also uh, an artist mathematician, which uh, that E would have been a good connection there. <laughs> wow, that's very generous of you to, it was a good guess, Aaron. <laughs> to say that. Yeah, the fall of the House of Escher. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh jump on over to question number five of the second half. Uh. Uh, we're gonna do a, a little more classic rock here, uh, and then there were three. Is a 1978 studio album marking a change in style for the recording band. This is due to a lineup change in which the lead vocal duties were picked up by the band's drummer. What band is this? More always, locked a, in. always good choice, by the way. If you need to phone a friend on this one, I can help you as a drummer. <laughs> here, I'll give you a little hint. <laughs> On the nose, Ken. Great job. Tag. All right. So uh, have, are you familiar with the song Susudio? Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> so uh, it would be the, the band that started the, the Earth in seven days, I believe is what it is, uh, Genesis. Oh. And we also said Genesis. You know, uh, yeah, that'd great. be uh, Phil Collins going from being I, the drummer to the lead singer. Yeah, no, great job. Points See, all around. I had that in my head. I had that in my head, and then I didn't trust myself. <laughs> I felt sure it, Bryn. I felt it. Yeah, they were a, they were um, a band of that's four. That's why I was like, oh. No, yeah, they were a band of four, and then they were three. After five in the second round, it looks like uh, Team Twas picking up 30 points, bringing them to 95, and uh, Pumping Iron picking up 30 points as well, bringing them to 151. Okay. Well, let's uh, enter the, the home stretch in the second half here. Uh, number six, the Spiel de Yaris is an annual award. Winners include Istanbul, Colt Express, Alhambra, and Azul. What is the Spiel de Yaris an award for? We can lock in. Well... We think it's some sort of race or competition, something sporty. Like maybe a car if race it was, or maybe if it was a made out of race. cardboard, maybe? If it was a cardboard race, does that help at all? Possibly. I can throw I can throw another dial. hint. Throw another hint for you guys home that one of the winners was a uh, Settlers of Catan. Oh, a board game competition. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's some sort of board game competition. Yeah. I like that idea. <laughs> um, yeah, we said this is the uh, annual German board game awards. Uh, <laughs> well done. Yeah. Uh, Spiel des Jahres uh, is German for game of the year. It is the uh, best oh board game God. or card game every year. Y y you know what's sad is that I almost guessed that it was something German specifically because I know that they're huge into board games and because of the word Spiel, but I just... <sighs> But listening to the various past winners, I just couldn't really. <laughs> I think the Dutch the also like their board games, right? Dutch boy. Only if you <laughs> roll a six. What, what's your favorite uh, board game, Dutch boy? Candyland. <laughs> I expected that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to stay on the subject of games for number seven. Uh, chess is a descendant of an ancient Indian game with a name that refers to a particular formation of the four divisions of an army, the elephantry, chariotry, cavalry, and infantry. Yogis may also recognize this as one of the nicknames for a low plank. What is the name of this game? Okay, I, I have an idea here from the yoga perspective. I like it. It might not be exactly a low plank, but we're going to be close. It's a medium lowish plank. There's a word that's on the tip of my tongue. What is that? What is this word that we hear? Give up. I give up. All right. They're out. Well, I know when I'm doing my yoga along with the uh, German guy on YouTube who absolutely kicks my ass every time when he says, like your and we're going to go from situation? plank to chaturanga, I cry. So we're going to go with chaturanga. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, no, Chaturanga is the right answer. Chaturanga is the name of the uh, OG chess, which uh, had, uh, I think, elephants instead of bishops, which is uh, objectively cooler. I have never said this before in my life, Ken, but thank you for being in good shape. No problem. <laughs> That's what the ladies say, too. No, Someday. Uh, <laughs> great. I hope. Great I job hope. there. We're going to we're gonna pivot into a little geography. Uh Two cities that straddle the U.S.-Mexico border have fitting names that are complementary portmanteaus. The city on the California side lends its name to an Arizona-based indie rock band, and the city on the Baja side is referenced in a song by the Grateful Dead. What are the names of these cities? Ken, if you trust me, I believe we can lock in. Yeah, it has nothing to do with yoga, so this is all you. Okay. <laughs> If you guys need me to tag, I only know one, but if it'll get us points, if I'm right, then it'll get us points. Okay, so, yeah, I, I would love a little uh, help from our friend here. Uh, we have a guess for one of the cities on the Mexico side, but not... Oh, that might be the same one as me. What What's your guess? Uh, our guess is Tijuana. Oh, okay. Uh, mine, I think, is an indie band, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I think it's... Calexico or Calexico, something like that, but C A L E X I C O. Okay. That's my guess. Because I think it's like California, Mexico put together. Oh, I see. 
No, go for it. We'll go. We'll go for. Go for it. We'll go for it. <laughs> All right, Jeff. They're uh, saying Colexico. Uh, we also have Colexico. I believe the other one is Mexicali. Uh, well done. Uh, yeah, no, the two cities were Mexicali on the Mexico side and Colexico on the California side. You no, know, uh, Mexicali Blues is one of my sleeper picks for uh, one of my favorite songs by the Dead. The other one seems so simple. I didn't even put that together. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, no, great job. Uh, it's uh, it's definitely a, a tricky one that I think I only know because I got a lot of family in the area in SoCal. Yeah. We're definitely more familiar with the other border. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go on to number nine of the second half. Uh, Domenico Draganetti was an Italian virtuoso and composer. His best-known works are concertos, which shone a rare spotlight on what otherwise common orchestral instrument, which was too difficult to hear until the advent of more modern instrument-making techniques. All right, we're going to go ahead and lock in here, um, just based on our knowledge of orchestral instruments and their relative loudness. Okay, we have we we have a couple guesses, but I think we're going to go with should we should we go for it? Yeah, go for it, Aaron. Okay. We're going to go with a melodica. Ooh. All right. Very good. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, we're just going based on, like, which um, which instruments we think has a hard, like, cap for loudness, and we went with the oboe. Uh, yeah, no, I think uh, I think this may have been a, a question that was hard for me to gauge because this was the instrument I played in high school. Uh, look over your shoulder, and you may see the bass sitting behind you. It is the upright bass. <laughs> ah, do you slap oh, at a bass? Right. Uh, oh. I, I have been known to a slap at a bass. All right. <laughs> uh, that is actually, yeah, that is actually a, a bass sitting in the the case behind me there. Um, yeah, no, it was a uh, back when they uh, made strings out of cat gut. Those big, thick gauge strings on the bass mm. just did not get very loud. Gotcha. Hmm. Well, uh, let's finish up the second half. How about with uh, a a question uh, going back into the realm of sports? Uh, number ten. The World Lopet Ski Federation is an organization consisting of 20 long-distance cross-country ski races from 20 different countries. The American race, which occurs in northern Wisconsin, shares its name with the Norwegian race, which is in turn named after a group of Norwegian rebels. What is this race called? The Cheese Run. The Ragna (laughs) Rockers. We're locked in with the cheese run Ragnarokers. <laughs> yeah. This is one of the questions where you you know it or you don't. <laughs> I mean, don't, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's the answer? No, no, we're, we're not getting this one. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, that was the uh, the Berkebiner. Oh, boy. I was right about to say that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. That's on the tip of my tongue. I would have thought uh, that a, a group of uh, northerners like the the three of us here, or the three groups of us here, would uh, would have had an idea on something like that. Yeah. Uh, no, great great job. Regardless, though, it was, it was a hard question to get. So, well, uh, it looks like at the end of regulation, uh, we have Twas with 110 points to wager in the final round, and uh, Pumping Iron with 191. So, what are those uh, final five categories to uh, wager on? Well, uh, I came up with these questions uh, before last Sunday, but the categories are Bears, Packers, Vikings, Lions, and Buccaneers. I was going to be Bears beats Battle I was hoping. (laughs) (laughs) All right, all the wagers are now locked in. Let's hear the questions. All right, uh, number one in the category of Bears. There are only eight living species of bear. Their closest relatives in the animal kingdom are what other carnivores? Though they may look much cuter, you still probably wouldn't want a kiss from them. Number two in the category of packers, the triple crown of hiking is one of the most prestigious accomplishments among American long-distance backpackers and is achieved by through-hiking three trails that span nearly 8,000 miles. The Pacific Crest Trail became widely known from Cheryl Strayed's book Wild, but name either of the other two trails. Uh, In the category of Vikings, while not a name commonly learned outside of his country of origin, Ethelstan could be considered one of the more significant figures in Western history. 
1924 AD, he inherited a royal title from his father. By 927, Ethelstan had conquered a Viking kingdom then called Jorvik and consolidated its crown with his own. As a result, most modern historians consider Ethelstan to be the first what? In the category of lions, the first of Hercules' 12 labors was to slay the Nemean lion, a vicious monster with an impenetrable hide and claws that could slice through any armor. With what handy technique did Hercules ultimately kill the lion? Hint, he couldn't get his foot behind the lion's tail, so he had to channel a different TV dad. And the fifth one in the category of buccaneers. The third of Hercules' 12 labors was to capture the Golden Hind. The Golden Hind is also the name of a ship captained by an English explorer who didn't let circumnavigating the globe stop him from extensively plundering Spanish ports and ships along the west coast of the Americas. Who is this explorer? whose subsequent knighthood is often cited as one of the precursors to the Anglo-Spanish War. All right, it looks like uh, these guys are going to discuss, and we'll be back with the answers. All right, all the answers are now locked in. Let's hear the questions one more time and see how it all shakes out. Sure. Uh, in the category of bears, we had there are only eight living species of bear. Their closest relatives in the animal kingdom are what other carnivores? Though they may look much cuter, you still probably wouldn't want a kiss from them. Not too sure on this one. Uh, we just went with the raccoon. The noble raccoon. Because they are adorable. We also went with the trash panda, the <laughs> raccoon. <laughs> That's what we call them here in Toronto is trash pandas. So, yeah, raccoons. Uh, we wa- we wagered 10 on that one. How about you guys? 20. 20. Uh, sure, no. Uh, a couple other things you might not want to kiss from would may include a rose. Uh, it is the seals. Oh. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the category of Packers, we had the Triple Crown of Hiking is one of the most prestigious accomplishments among American long-distance backpackers. And it's achieved by through hiking three trails that span nearly 8,000 miles. The Pacific Crest Trail became widely known from Cheryl Strayed's book Wild, but could you name either of the other two trails? Well, one of my friends uh, did the Appalachian Trail in its entirety, and I was following her quest on uh, Facebook. So we said Appalachian Trail. We also said Appalachian Trail as being the longest trail in the United States, which I've heard of. <laughs> and we did 10 points again? Unfortunately, we wagered nothing on this one. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, you can pat yourself on the back because uh, you got the answer right. Uh, it was the Appalachian Trail, and the other one was the Continental Divide Trail, which kind of runs down the rim of the Rockies. Uh, in the category of Vikings, while not a name commonly learned outside of his country of origin, Ethelstan could be considered one of the more significant figures in Western history. In 924 AD, he inherited a royal title from his father. By 927, Ethelstan had conquered a Viking kingdom then called Jorvik, and consolidated its crown with his own. As a result, most modern historians consider Ethelstan to be the first what? All right, we wagered 10 here, and I'm going to pass it to Jeff, because this question made me say, who what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know exactly what uh, Wade's looking for here, but I think um, he could technically be considered the first king of England. He was certainly the first Anglo-Saxon, so we, uh, we said king of England. <laughs> we went in a very different direction on this one. Uh, I was thinking that this was maybe the first uh, Scandinavian or Norwegian, perhaps. Uh, well, it sounds like uh, Jeff knew exactly what I was looking for here. Yeah, uh, the Viking kingdom then called Jorvik, we know now as York. And Ethelstan was the first king of England. Oh, I mean, we thank should you. know that because Toronto thank you. used to be York. <laughs> TV show Vikings for knowing who Athelstan <laughs> is. <laughs> In the uh, category of lions, the first of Hercules' 12 labors was to slay the Nemean lion, a vicious monster with an impenetrable hide and claws that could slice through any armor. With what handy technique did Hercules ultimately kill the lion? As a hint, he couldn't get his foot behind the lion's tail, so he had to channel a different TV dad. For uh, for 10 points, if he got his foot there, I think he'd be sticking his foot up his ass like Red Foreman. But uh, I think it was more the Homer Simpson route, and he choked him out. 
<laughs> we also went the Homer Simpson route. Yeah, her, the strangling, wringing yeah. its neck. Yeah. Yeah, uh, all, all those uh, fancy details about the lion and Hercules just choked him to death. Uh, strangled is <laughs> right. Well, you said handy, and you just you emphasize <laughs> the handy. So yeah, yeah. I was I was trying to get a, a Scranton strangler reference somewhere in there, but I couldn't quite yeah. fit it. Uh, and finishing off uh, in the category of buccaneers, the third of Hercules' twelve labors was to capture the Golden Hind. The Golden Hind is also the name of a ship captained by an English explorer who didn't let circumnavigating the globe stop him from extensively plundering Spanish ports and ships along the west coast of the Americas. Who is this explorer, whose subsequent knighthood is often cited as one of the precursors of the, to the Anglo-Spanish War? Uh, for 10 points, we know this person is a sir, and uh, we said Drake, and not the creepy musician. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is probably not right, but... Um... Yeah, we put down Captain Cook. Uh, that is a great guess. Uh, but uh, no, he did not win the uh, <laughs> uh, MVP and Defensive Player of the Year award, but it was Sir Francis Drake. All right, after doing some score tabulation here, uh, Twas uh, actually ended the game with 100 points. So <laughs> <Woo-hoo>. <laughs> good score. Yeah, very good score. Uh, and uh, today's cream of the crop with 221 points is a uh, pumping... F.E., or as I learned, Pumping Iron, based on the film starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. The cream of the crop! Nobody does it better. Yeah, we are looking a lot like Rocky at the end of Rocky 2. Victorious, but bruised. Bruised and battered, <laughs> yeah. They put yeah, up an excellent, home, but... excellent fight, guys. I feel like the <laughs> yeah. piece of meat. Uh, Wade, thank you very much for putting all these questions together. Um, as you said, you know some of them might not have been in uh, some of our wheelhouses, but they're all very well written and uh, covered a lot of topics, and we learned a lot of cool things today, especially the, the Bond round in the middle. But uh, any shout-outs or anyone you'd like to say hello to? Any any uh, the final statements here? Yeah, no, uh, I want to give a, a quick thank you to uh, a lot of my friends who helped me write these questions. In particular, my friend uh, Nick helped uh, write a few of these questions today, and he's also uh, an avid listener to the podcast and got me introduced to it in the first place. Thank you, Nick. And I just want to take a quick minute to encourage uh, everyone listening to, if they're able to, just check out the Patreon kickback. Um, you guys do a lot of great work. The product you put out is uh, worth every penny any of us could ever give you, and uh, I really appreciate what you guys do, and it's a... Uh, the least any of us can do is to kick back a, a few dollars to help keep this uh, podcast up and running. Thank you very much. That is much appreciated, especially because I forgot to do a Patreon drop this episode. There you go. There so, it was. Yeah. <laughs> Thank there, you very there much. Went. No, no, uh, no truer endorsement than uh, from one of our uh, patrons and avid listeners. And uh, Brennan, Aaron, um, make sure you tell everyone where they can find your show. We appreciate you coming on today and and uh, staying up late with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, I I will say for myself, uh, your program. Uh, I absolutely love the Golden Palace episode, uh, the Don Cheadle starring uh, Golden Girl spinoff, and the Sports Night one, but. People can check that out, but how can they find you and, and any uh, last words from you guys? Well, thank you so much for that endorsement, and thank you so much for having us on the show. This was a really challenging <laughs> game, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks so much, Wade, for these uh, these questions. Uh, I feel like I learned a lot, but now I feel like I'm ready for bed because <laughs> my brain is tired. <laughs> no, I want to I thank you for your patience, if nothing else, but yeah. uh, you're going to be really good at anagrams tomorrow now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you can find our podcast, That Was a Show, um, on any common podcast platform. Also, our homepage is anchor.fm slash that was a show. You can also follow us on Instagram at that was a show. And um, yeah, we're very excited for people to check us out. And thank you very much for uh, bring a, bringing us on. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, any of you are welcome to hop by and watch some bad sitcoms with us if you want ever want to. <laughs> All right. That sounds fun. And please and that, do suggest. That was a show with a question mark, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So for if you're looking up the pod to listen to it, you're going to use the question mark. But on uh, Instagram, we just we don't have the question mark. OK. Yeah. And, yeah. and that was our show, right? I think so. All right. Well, I've got an episode all about uh, sports night to go listen to. So, all right. Well, for our guests, Jeff, Neil, Matt, who's somewhere, mm-hmm. and myself, Ken, that was triviality? Question mark. What is the Spiel des Jahres an award for? We can lock in. The table just lifted up a little bit on Jeff's side. <laughs> <laughs>